The Buddha traces the causes of suffering back to ignorance. And the formal definition is ignorance of the Four Noble Truths. But you can hear the Four Noble Truths, learn about them, memorize them, and still be ignorant. The definition could be translated in another way, where you see things in terms of the Four Noble Truths. That's getting closer. In other words, you look at your experience, what's coming in through the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind. How do you see it in terms of where there's stress, what's causing the stress, what the cessation of stress would be, and how you would practice in order to bring about that cessation? That's asking you to take on a framework that you don't normally take. The normal framework is me in the world, encountering things I like and don't like, suffering from the things I don't like. That's the way we tend to think about the issue. The Buddha is asking us to look at it in a different way. And with each of those ways of looking, he says there's a duty. When you see that something is stressful, you try to comprehend it. In other words, you watch it and try to understand it to the point where you gain dispassion for it. Because as he defines the nature of suffering, it's clinging. It's something you do. You're not simply a passive victim of suffering. You're actively doing it. Things you cling to, things that you hold dearly, and those are precisely the things you suffer from. So you've got to develop some dispassion for them, otherwise there's no getting away from suffering. With the cause, craving, you, you want to abandon it. Craving or sensuality, in other words, in enjoying sensual fantasies. Craving for becoming, wanting to take on an identity in this world so that you can get the pleasures out of the world. And then craving for non-becoming. As you find that your identity is not working well, you want to destroy it. That's to be abandoned. The cessation is to be realized, and the cessation is defined basically as the abandoning of craving. So there's two layers right there. You abandon craving and then you watch, observe. You realize that when you let go of the craving, your suffering really does stop. We practice the path so we can see that happening, putting the mind in a position where it can see it. This is why we concentrate, taking the Buddhist definition of right mindfulness as our frame of reference. In other words, you're going to stay with a body right here, in and of itself. You're not going to be thinking about the body and the world, either your imaginary worlds or in the, the actual human world. Just what is it like to have a body right here? One of the ways you can look at that is with a breath. Focusing on the breath, simply watching it as a process on its own. And you're going to see how it's connected with other things in the body and other things in the mind, but that's what you want to see is the process. Because it's in understanding the process that we're going to be able to find ignorance, because ignorance is one of those elusive things. It's like trying to turn a light on darkness. If you turn a light on darkness, it's not darkness anymore. You want to see ignorance in action. And as John Suat pointed out one time, if you're going to see it in action, you have to look right next to it. Now the Buddha talks about different ways of understanding how ignorance is caused and how it functions in causing other things. The primary one, of course, is independent core arising. He talks about how ignorance conditions fabrication. So what have you got right next to ignorance? You've got the breath, that's bodily fabrication, and you've got director thought and evaluation, that's verbal fabrication, and then you've got feelings and perceptions, mental fabrication. So this is one of the reasons why we focus on the breath, thinking about the processes of how the breath is fabricated, and thinking about directed thought and evaluation and the perceptions we bring to the breath. 
because our ignorance is right next to these things, and it's conditioning these things. You might say the path is one of really getting to know these processes well. In the beginning you're working not with knowledge, you're working out of conviction that this is where this is going to be a good place to look. And you get used to staying here, because ignorance is not going to show itself quickly, so you've got to be patient. And you can't say, well, I don't like doing this. My mind doesn't settle down very easily. You've got to look where it's happening. It's like that old joke about the, the man traveling from one island to another in the Philippines. So I learned this from my Filipino foster family when I was an exchange student. This guy's keys fell off the side of the boat. And so they asked him, well, why don't you look for the keys? Why don't you jump down to the water and find the keys? He said, well, I want to get into the port. Why is that? Because the light is better there. You look where you lost the keys. You don't look where you think you'd rather look. So you're ignorant here, so you've got to watch right here. Watch your breath. The mind resists, you keep coming back. If the mind resists for a long time, you might have to find another way of getting the mind to settle down. The Buddha talks about there being a fever in the body or a fever in the mind, which means you're getting antsy and you don't want to settle down right here. Well, you find another topic. Find something you find inspiring. You might think about the Buddha, the Dhamma, the Sangha. Think about your generosity. Think about your virtue. In times like this, you want to think about how good it has been, the times when you actually were able to carry through with the precepts when it was difficult, or you were able to be generous when it was difficult. To give you a sense of well-being. But eventually you do want to get back to the breath, because again, that's right next to where ignorance is. The way you ordinarily direct your thoughts and evaluate things. In other words, the way you talk to yourself, that's right next to ignorance, too. A lot of times there are conversations in the mind. You find they operate on many levels. This is one of the things you're going to discover as yeah, you get the mind to settle down. You peel away one level of conversation and you find, oh, there's another one. There's a conversation and there's somebody commenting on it. And sometimes there's a commenter on the commentator. So you get really, really still so you can see these things. To see what, it, what are the various levels talking about. You want to peel these levels away to get to one that's just basically asking the question, what to do next, what to do next, what to do next. It's a question. At the very basis of our experience of time and place. There's a question. And you can see that, and you ask yourself, well, who's talking to whom in here? That's one of getting really close to ignorance. And of course, there are your perceptions, the labels you place on things, and your feelings. One of the reasons why so much attention is given to understanding feelings of pain is because a lot of your inner conversation and your inner perceptions are going to hover around the pain. Of course, there's going to be ignorance hovering around them. This is one of the reasons why we focus right here, because all these things are right here, and they're right next to ignorance. As you get the mind to settle down, you find some of these layers of fabrication would peel away. The direct of thought and evaluation peel away after a while, and you're just with this one perception of the breath coming in and going out. Minimal conversation, but that requires a strong perception. And there will be the feelings, the feeling tones, the feelings of pleasure and rapture, and then the pleasure gets stronger, the rapture gets stronger. And then it gets too much. You try to tune into a more subtle level of pleasure. 
and the rapture begins to evaporate. It's worth noting that the levels of jhana are defined by their feeling tone. As I mentioned the other day, the Buddha doesn't say, the first jhana accompanied by pleasure and rapture. He just says, first jhana, pleasure and rapture accompanied by directed thought and evaluation. You are the feeling tone. But again, you have to stay with the breath. You have to stay with your frame of reference, otherwise the feeling tone is going to take over. But you've got the feeling right here. You can look right here at the feeling, how you respond to the feeling of pleasure. When it seems to be too gross, even the pleasure gets too gross, and there's a feeling of equanimity. How do you understand that? The Buddha says, you want to watch right there. Some people say, ah, oh, this is it. Everything's very still, very quiet. They talk about returning to your pure nature of knowing. But it's not. It's just equanimity. And you can get fixated on the equanimity. But again, the ignorance is right there, right nearby. So this is one of the ways you get close to ignorance, so you can see it. There's another analysis which says that ignorance is kept going by the hindrances. Which means that if you understand the processes by which the mind gets distracted, the steps by which it changes from being focused on the breath to being focused on, say, a desire for a certain food, or a desire to see justice done here or there, see people punished, whatever the hindrance, what are the steps between being focused here and moving? There tends to be a lot of ignorance in there as well. This is why you want to be as alert as possible to when the mind slips off, so you can catch it and you begin to see stages in the process of moving that you didn't see before. That's another way of clearing up ignorance. Then there's a passage where the Buddha talks about how ignorance is fed by the three asavas, or outflows, effluence in the mind sensual desire, becoming, and ignorance itself. How does sensual desire flow out of the mind? It's not the case that something beautiful has to come, and then you feel a desire for it, or a thought of something beautiful has to come, and then you feel a desire for it. Sometimes the desire is there before you have anything specific to latch onto. It's going to look for something to latch onto. Can you see that happen? This current that the Johns talk about so much, the current of the mind flowing out. Can you watch it flow, but without your going with it? Either to latch onto a particular pleasure or to latch onto a oh, thought world in which you might take on an identity. So as you notice, all the things that you need to look at in order to see ignorance, they're all right here as you're focused on the breath and thinking in terms of fabrication, thinking in terms of how to keep the mind from going with the hindrances, or thinking in terms of how to watch the mind as it flows out. It's like being a hunter. You know that the animals go to a certain place. We go to that place, and you hang out, and you're very quiet and very watchful, because you can't time when they're going to come. You can't say, well, I'm going to be hungry at 4 o'clock, so I want something to come by by 3 so we can have it in time for when I'm going to be hungry. I talked with an anthropologist one time who was talking about how in more modern anthropology, when you're going to go study a primitive tribe, you're trying to learn all the skills that the people in the tribe practice so that you really understand the tribe, the life of the tribe from within. And he was saying there's one skill that educated Westerners really have trouble mastering. In fact, they can't master it all, and that's 
old ways of hunting. And we're talking about modern ways of hunting where you, everything is tipped in favor of the person with lots of gear. The old time of hunting, when you had to just be very quiet, very still, but very alert at the same time. That's, that was the problem. It's that mind state that's quiet and alert and very, very patient. So even though it may hard, be hard to develop, that's what we've got to develop. As I said, ignorance will show itself at these places, but it's never going to tell you when. And we're all too eager usually to fill in the blanks, thinking we know when we really don't, thinking we understand when we don't. So it requires a certain humility, the admission that, yeah, I really don't know. Because otherwise, if you don't admit that you don't know, you don't even have in your mind the idea that what you think you know could be ignorance. But that's precisely what it is. In the same way that the things you think will give you happiness, the things you like are precisely the things that are causing you to suffer. The vulnerable truths are not intuitive. They make sense on paper, yeah. But when you actually look at how the mind works, they go against a lot of our habits. And it's in learning how to develop new habits that we can actually see things in terms of the noble truths and carry through the duties. So it's always important that you bring to the practice the attitude that you're willing to learn. Or as John Sowell would say, you've been acting in stupid ways. Now you recognize your stupidity. You're not going to realize the total depth of your stupidity until you're done with ignorance. Which is one of the reasons why when people really do gain awakening, there's no pride. It's a realization that it's something you should have known, but you kept ignoring. But when you finally do know it, that's when there's the end of suffering. And that's all that matters at that point. And so on. So when you find the ultimate happiness that comes with that, you don't care about whether there's somebody there or not somebody there, whether there's a self there or no self there to experience. The happiness is sufficient in and of itself. Questions of self and not self don't matter. Or as John Mahabua would say, if you take ideas of self and not self and try to plaster them on nirvana, it's like you're covering it with excrement. When you find it, it's that pure, they say. So check and see for yourself.